Zacharias and Elizabeth. And they're a interesting couple, um, some very good lessons that come out of their lives. And it's just amazing, I think, when we look at the scriptures, particularly in this case, it's Luke, how careful the words are chosen about these, this couple and about the circumstances that they lived in. Uh, Luke is one of my favourite authors because he just leaves you little hints that you can then expand out to, to what the whole picture is. So it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea. Well, that tells us which Herod it is, doesn't it? It's not Herod Antipas because he wasn't king of Judea. It can only be Herod the Great. He was the only Herod who was Herod in charge of Judea. He had other territory as well. In the days of Herod. So what is the times in which Zacharias and Elizabeth were living? In the days of Herod. Well, in BC 37, the Romans appointed Herod as the king of Israel, including Judea. He ruled till he died. Now, it's unsure whether he died BC 4 or AD 4 or anywhere in between, because as you probably know, there's a little bit of uncertainty about exactly the time when our Lord was born. The Herods were an Edomite family which converted to Judaism by the Maccabees. And Herod the Great is probably known because of the great things that he built. He built all sorts of amazing structures. Here's just a couple. The Herod, the, the, the temple, the great temple in Jerusalem built by Herod, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So that shows you it was a pretty grand building. Um, another one that you can go and visit today is the aqueduct at Caesarea. It goes for miles, very carefully built, very solidly built, right on the coastline. It's been hit by waves many times, and it's there 2,000 years later. That shows how well he built it. And of course, there's other works. Masada, we know about. Herodium, which is down near Bethlehem. Machaerus, which is on the other side of the Jordan. The tombs of the patriarchs at Hebron. And there's more. So he was a great builder. Um, however, some other things about Herod. He was an absolutely cruel tyrant. We know about the massacre of the infants in Bethlehem when the wise men went back and didn't tell him where was this king of the Jews, he just decided, well, I know it's in Bethlehem, so let's get rid of all the kids. Anyone under two, and they're just murdered. You know, just cruel. I've got there that he also killed some of his own wives. And I guess you know the story of Mariam, who was his favourite wife. And one time when he had to head off with the Romans to go down south to deal with an insurrection that was somewhere down there, and he commissioned his army general that if he died, then he was, this army general was to uh, kill his wives because he didn't want his wives to be married to anyone else, even if he was gone. And so when he came back from this, Mariam had found out about this. And this is his favourite wife. And so she confronted him and said, hey, what's this bit about you getting me to be killed if you don't come back? So what does he do? He kills her on the spot and then was haunted for the rest of his life, as Josephus records, that he'd killed his favourite wife. You know, this man is cruel, impulsive. And he was hated by the Jews because, range of things, he had many Jews murdered. Anyone that got in his way, well, he just got, got them killed. He put the Roman eagle in the temple, which caused a huge furor. And as a result, there was an insurrection amongst the Jews. And again, he killed all the people that were involved in the insurrection. He also decided who he would appoint as high priests. So no longer was the high priest hereditary as it was required under the law. Eh, the high priests were appointed by, um, by Herod. And he taxed the Jews very heavily because he was building all these amazing projects and he needed money. So he just lifted the taxes more and more and more. So you can see that he wouldn't be particularly loved. Um, territory of Herod the Great is all of this area here, and it's also got different colours to show uh, the areas that were given to um, once he passed away. 
for example, to Herod Antipas, who had Galilee and Perea. Now, it's interesting to look at the high priests appointed by Herod, because the first one that he appointed, which was Ananias, I haven't pronounced that very well, you can see the dates. The second one is a really interesting one, Aristobulus III, and you'll see that um, he's in 36 BC, like the previous high priest, and like the one after him. So we had three high priests in one year. Why was that? Well, because when someone displeased Herod, he got rid of them. And Aristobulus III had the distinction of being high priest for one day. Now, what happened was that uh, Mark Antony, who was, you probably remember him from the time of Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, he demanded that Herod should make uh, Aristobulus the third high priest because he was the last of the Maccabees. You're probably familiar with the Maccabees family, the Maccabean revolt that got rid of um, the terrible worship of, uh, of God corrupted by having a pig offered on the altar. Well, so what happened is Herod said, okay, I'll put him in as high priest. The next day he invited him round to his palace in uh, um, Jericho and invited him to go for a swim in the pool. And while he was swimming in the pool, Herod drowned him. So he'd complied with what Mark Antony had said, but he got rid of Aristobulus in just one day. There were other high priests that lasted only a week. So number seven, Joazer ben Boethus, he lasted just a week. And he was actually restored later on. You can see him as number 10. So it gives you an idea of how, how horrible it would have been to live in this time. And if you're a priest working in the temple and the high priest is some arbitrary appointment by Herod, well, it's going to be pretty awful because there's no clear, consistent direction. Anything to do with godliness is just purely coincidental. It's all about achieving and managing to survive under Herod. <laughs> Well, I think there's a lesson for that in us, for us, in that, um, you know, we have governments that sometimes make decisions that are not very nice. And, you know, the flavour of governments these days is <clears throat> increasingly anti-Christian and it's increasingly supporting of LGBTQ plus and all that sort of horrible stuff. But although it's not ideal compared to the days of Herod, I think we can still thank our God for the government that we have that allows us to assemble like this free and with, without any terror or, com, or compulsion. So it would have been very different in those days. Now, we then come in Luke 1 verse 5. We've only got through a few words. And it talks about, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And again, Luke is amazingly accurate. He's a certain priest. It was sometimes referred to as the nobody priest because he was an older man, but he wasn't among the chief priests. And normally what happened was that uh, once you got older, you went up in the ranks of the priests. And so when you were old, you became one of the chief priests. But he hasn't. And he's of the course of a buyer. Again, Luke is amazingly accurate, brethren and sisters. And you know this. You might recall that David set up 24 orders of priests in 1 Chronicles 24. And each order was worked one week at the temple twice a year. So they divided the year into six months because you can see there's 24 orders. We've got 52 weeks in the year. So it's approximately once every six months that you would be, in, that you would be on duty at the temple but then all the priests had to be on duty for Passover, Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles. So that meant another couple of weeks. So in effect, they were on duty in the temple one month a year, which is only one twelfth of the time. Now, although there was 24 orders of priests, there was only four orders that came back from Babylon under Ezra. So what is to be done? Well, what they did is they divided up those four orders to make another 20 out of it. They were allocated 20 out of that and they were called courses. So if you were of the course of someone, 
you weren't, didn't actually belong to that family, but you'd been, if you like, um, put in to fill the void of the, the orders that hadn't come back. So, you know, I think that's just another indication of the exactness of Luke. Everything he gives, he gives the right name. You notice in the Acts, when he gives titles to those who are in power, he always chooses exactly the right, um, the right titles because he's very careful. And of course, the lesson out of that is Luke uses exactly the right word for the course of a buyer. It's just another example of the evidence that we can trust the exactness of the scriptures. Now, I don't know about you, but I find these things encouraging when time after time you find that here is another incidental proof that the scriptures can be relied upon. We can place our whole trust that this is undoubtedly the word of God. Well, another dimension to uh, Zacharias, he's a priest. And there was very grand ceremonies that they did in Herod's temple with the priesthood. Um, this is one, this is a, taken from a, a book that's a very interesting book on, Herod, on the, the temple, as it was called, the second temple by the Jews. Um, you can see the grandeur that, there, that is there with them all dressed the same, great ceremony happening. The externals look good, but the chief priests were absolutely corrupt. They extracted money from the temple. You know, those big donation box that, boxes that they had in the treasury at the temple. And they took a cut out of that. There was some for the temple, but they felt they were entitled to have their own cut. So there was a reward then for becoming promoted to become one of the chief priests, you got to get this extra income stream. Uh, and there were, as you're probably aware, a large number of priests. Josephus says there was 20,000 priests. That's a lot of priests. And most of the priests lived in Jerusalem or Jericho. You might think, why would most of the priests live there? Well, the reasons are... Jerusalem, well, the temple's there. The chief priests are all living there. So if you want to get on your, in your career as a priest, you need to be in Jerusalem. And quite a number of the priests, according to Josephus, had a house in Jerusalem and another house in Jericho. Why would you have another house in Jericho? A couple of good reasons. Herod the Great had his alternate palace at Jericho, and he was there in the winter months. Why Jericho? Because in the winter, Jerusalem, it snows. And while it's snowing in Jerusalem at Jericho, it can be a, a balmy 20 degrees because it's sort of a subtropical environment there. It's rather unique. So the priests enjoyed life. Jerusalem is a much nicer place to be in in summer because it doesn't get quite as hot as other places. But in winter, you want to be at Jericho. And also you get the benefit of being able to cozy up to Herod. You know, it's, it's just such a corrupt system, isn't it? Now, this is an artist's impression of the Herod the Great's um, winter palace in Jericho. Now, so most of the priests are in Jericho or Jerusalem. But when you look up the Levitical cities that were appointed by Joshua, they shouldn't have been there. Joshua 21, verse 3, And the children of Israel gave unto the Levites out of their inheritance at the commandment of Yahweh these cities and their suburbs. And this map has got the, the cities of the priests. And if we zoom in you know, this area here, we can see where the priestly cities were. Now you can see that there's priestly cities like uh, Hebron, Jerusalem's there, but it's got a, a black dot because it's not a priestly city. Down the south in Judah, we've got Jatta, Eshtomar, Jatir, and, and they're the, the, the priestly cities there. Now, where is Zacharias? Well, we know where he is because when Mary goes down to go and see Elizabeth, it says in chapter 1, verse 39 of Luke, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste 
into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So where are they living, Zacharias and Elizabeth? They're living in the hill country of Judah. So you can see where that is. So they're either in Hebron or Jutta or Eshtemar or Jatta. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not in Jericho. Why are they there? Because they're doing what God says. They're at the place God says they should be at. Now, wouldn't that be hard? That would be a hard decision to say, well, that's where we ought to be because that's where the Bible says we ought to be. And that's going to be a very career-limiting move for him, isn't it? But it shows that they were very genuine in their belief, doesn't it? I think I might have got ahead of myself. I have. So this is the area that I've just referred to there. So a lesson for us. Zacharias made big decisions involving personal sacrifices. He chose to live in the hill country of Judea because he was doing what God wanted. And sometimes in our lives, we have to make big decisions like that too. Choices, whether they're careers or where we live, etc. Um, because we make those choices so that we can be with the ecclesia, so that we can be doing the things of God and not necessarily progressing in this world. So back in, uh, in Luke 1, we come to the next verse. We're not making much progress, but we will make more progress in a moment. Verse 6, and Luke says, oh, I didn't finish off verse 5. So Zacharias was of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, or in the Hebrew, it's Elisheba. And that's the same name that Aaron's wife had. So, you know, she's very much named after um, the ancestors of the Levites, so Zacharias is a priest from a priestly family, and so is Elizabeth from the high priest's family. Verse 6, and they were both righteous before God. That is a huge statement. Righteous before God. Noah is described in similar terms in Genesis 7 verse 1. But there's also a little play on words happening here. Because you see, the word righteous is related to the word for Sadducees, because the word for righteous is tzedek. Now, Terza will probably give me the correct pronunciation, but that's about it. But, you see, the Sadducees took their name to be from that. They were the, they were the righteous ones. And what was their righteousness? Righteous before men. It was a sham because they weren't really righteous at all. They were avaricious. They wanted the best for themselves and they didn't really care for the people. <coughs> but you see, Zacharias and Elizabeth are righteous before God. That's amazing, isn't it? And that's, of course, what we want to be as well, isn't it? Walking in all the commandments, the moral principles and the ordinances, the ceremonial precepts, blameless bit like the Apostle Paul that describes himself as being a, a, a Pharisee and blameless concerning all the ordinances of the law. You know, these people are amazing people. So here they are. They're making sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice to serve God, to do what the scriptures say they should do. And then we come to verse 7. And they have no child. Sorry, I've missed something. I'm getting ahead of myself again. A lesson out of uh, verse 6 is we need to be careful that we're not leading a double life like the Sadducees. They pretended to be good, to, pretended to be righteous, but really underneath they weren't. And, you know, it can be a temptation to have one persona when we're here with brethren and sisters in the ecclesial hall and a different natural persona somewhere else. But of course, we should be exactly the same no matter where we are, shouldn't we? It's the same character that we should have, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 7, the drama of their lives. Elizabeth is barren. 
And in verse 36, she's actually called the barren one. It's not quite obvious, but when you look at the Greek, it is there. It says, verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called the barren one. Yosh. Just imagine if you were in her shoes and you walk down the street and people say, oh, that's the barren one over there. You know, that would be very, very hard. Here she is, an older sister, and that's been happening all her life. Now, we know that they'd prayed for children in verse 13 because we're told, the angel says, thy prayer is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. So they'd been praying. When we look at it, there's actually quite a number of sisters in the Bible that are barren. And here's some of them. So Sarah was barren, Rebecca, Rachel, Manoah, Manoah's wife, I should say, Hannah, and of course we've got Elizabeth. Were any of these not godly? <coughs> they were all godly, weren't they? So why does God do this? It's about character development, isn't it? In many cases, they were given children through prayer or angelic visitation, weren't they? In the case of Sarah, it was angelic visitation, wasn't it? Just like it is in the circumstances of Elizabeth. So to be childless in those days was the stigma that was to be born. It was part of, if you like, enduring. Enduring the difficulties of life but still maintaining a faith and trust in God. So it would have been pretty easy to be resentful to God in the case of Elizabeth and Zacharias. Here they are, they're making tough decisions to be godly people. They're choosing to live where they should be. Zacharias is doing the work of a priest in the temple when he should have been a chief priest. He's putting up with all of the corruption that's happening in the temple because that's what God wants them to do. And you can imagine, you could be thinking, well, we're doing our best for God, but he won't give us a child. Where is God? Does he care? And sometimes times in our lives, we can feel that too. But God gave them a huge blessing, didn't they? A son, the forerunner of Messiah, the first prophet in 400 years. Wow. And the greatest prophet ever. We're told that in, in Luke when the Lord Jesus Christ talks about John. And he says that amongst those that were born a woman, there's arisen no greater prophet than John the Baptist. So he's greater than all of those prophets. You think about it, greater than Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. Wow. John the Baptist was quite some person, wasn't he? So why did God choose Zacharias and Elizabeth? Well, I think that is the, the answer to that unfolds in the story. Lesson for us. When troubles come in our life, are we resentful to God? As Christadelphians, we can sometimes slip into that mode of thinking because here we are working in the ecclesia. We're trying to do the things of God and things happen to us. Hard things happen to us. Terrible things sometimes happen to us. And we can think, why, why, why God are you doing that to, to people that are trying? Well, of course, we know the answer, don't we? We, we need to remind ourselves of the answer that what God wants in us is tried faith. It's one thing to have faith, and we get faith from the Word of God, don't we? That's the only place it comes from. And we learn about the things of the Scriptures to build up our faith. But then to be in the kingdom, God wants us to have tried faith. And the only way that tried faith comes, brethren and sisters, is through trials, isn't it? And sometimes those trials are pretty, pretty hard. But we've got to keep in mind, God seeks our eternal good. You know, I, I was, some years ago, I started studying Hebrews 11 because I had some talks that I had to do on Hebrews 11. And 
I looked down the list of people there and thought, now, what sort of lives did these have? Did any of these people in Hebrews 11 have an easy life? Mm -mm, Not one. All of them had major dramas in their lives, didn't they? So heres it's not a total catalogue of the faithful, but it's a slice, isn't it? And they all had troubles in their lives. So, but they're going to be in the kingdom. We're told that, aren't we? And we want to be with them too. So God's going to work with us and give us difficult trials as well. Right. So we get now to verse 8 of 9. And it came to pass, verse 8, that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. So again, Luke is very exact. This is, this is telling us that he's executing the priest's office now in the temple. The rest of the time, the priests were to be back where they lived and they were to be teaching priests, weren't they? That was the reason that most of their time was away from the temple because their role was to teach the people. Malachi chapter 2, be a teaching priest. And verse 9, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of Yahweh, the temple of the Lord. So, it's not hard to work out that you only got to offer the incense once in a lifetime as a priest. And the reason is because there was 20,000 priests, and when you divide up the the working years of a priest and how often they would be on duty, it works out about once. And in fact, according to the Talmud, there was a rule that when it came to the beginning of the day, when all the priests gathered together, and you can see there's a picture of that up there, that anyone who had been able to offer incense was excluded from being in the lot for offering incense for that day. So here's a picture of what the the Talmud describes as the, is the process for taking the lot. Now, I just thought, until I read this section out of the Talmud, that taking a lot was, you know, you all got different straws or tokens or whatever, and then um, if you pulled yours out and it was the one that was, uh, you're the, the one to, to offer the incense that day, well, that's what you do. But the Talmud describes a, a rather funny process, which you can see here. You can see all these fellas holding up fingers. And apparently the man out the front, who was a chief priest, would say, right, everyone ready? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call out a number, but I want you to put your hands up first. And when I call out a number, the person whose fingers match the number, so it's a number between 1 and 10, um, then they're the one that offer the, that is, gets the lot to offer the incense. That's a bit bizarre, isn't it? But that's apparently the way it works. So you can see all these fellas with different fingers up and the man out the front's pointing to someone and so it's your turn this time. <coughs> so this would have been quite an experience, wouldn't it, to be selected to be the one. You didn't know in advance. It just happened on that morning. And they were apparently up quite early in the morning. They were, all of this was done sort of between 5 and 6 a.m., very early start to the day. So the lot is taken and suddenly Zacharias, after all of these years, he's now an old man, is going to offer incense. This is apparently the greatest thing that you could aspire to as an ordinary priest. So he's going to do it. Just imagine how excited he would have been. So he goes in to offer incense. And it says... Um, verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, which, by the way, is just another proof that incense is a symbol of prayer, Psalm 142. And it says, verse 11, and there appeared unto him an angel of Yahweh, of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So we tried to depict that with a bit of photoshopping and etc., etc. So you can see Zacharias is there. He's in front of the altar of incense. And the angel appears on the right-hand side. First angelic appearance in 500 years. The last time we have a recorded instance of an angel appearing is at the time of Daniel. Wow. This is a very special occasion, isn't it? 
And what does the angel say? He prophesies of the birth of um, John the Baptist. Verse 12, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. If you do a study on the angels, you find that that's a very common reaction of human beings, that when they're confronted with an angel, they're fearful. And you can imagine that that will, I can imagine that being the case for me too. All of a sudden, someone appeared and you think, wow, but also they're impressive. Often they're, it's recorded that they're radiating with light. You think, wow, this would be something. And the angel says unto him, fear not, Zacharias. And that's often what angels say at the beginning to the person they're appearing to. Fear not, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And we go through all the detail that uh, was read for us by uh, Brother Barry. Verse 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, talking about what, John will do and he'll go before him, that is before Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah. And I think this is talking about the spirit and power of Elijah, Elijah after Mount Carmel. You know, when you do a study on Elijah, it's amazing. You see Elijah before Mount Carmel and he thinks, I'm the only person left, doesn't he? He comes to, to, to Mount Sinai and says to God, look, uh, no, this is really terrible. You need to do something about Israel because I, even I, am only, the only one left. But after Mount Sinai, it's a different Elijah because he's told by God that there's 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to, to Baal. And he's out there and he gets Elisha and they set up all these little schools of the prophets all through the land. So all of a sudden there's quite a few more. And it's the... It's then we see a different Elijah, a softer Elijah with Elisha, who turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. And that's what's prophesied in Malachi chapter 4, isn't it? That when Elijah comes at the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Jews, that's what he's going to be. He's going to turn the hearts. He's going to be a, a more understanding man. A wonderful little prophecy. And Zacharias, verse 18, says unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. He doesn't believe it. <laughs> he doesn't believe the angel. And the angel says, angel knows that. Verse 19, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Verse 20, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. Because thou believest not my words. Goodness me. So that tells us that the angel can read Zacharias' mind. Because when you look at Zacharias' answer to the angel, it's almost the same as what Mary says to the same angel Gabriel. So where's the difference? You have a look at verse 34. After Gabriel has appeared to Mary... Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? That's quite similar to saying, as Zacharias says, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and well stricken in years. Both of them are saying, Look, um, how can this be? I've got a problem because I can't understand it because there's a problem for both of them. So, on an external appearance, you mightn't be able to tell the difference. The angel looks straight into Zacharias' mind and realises that he doesn't really believe. And as a result, he's made dumb, isn't he? How could you not believe an angel? You imagine a majestic angel turns up and speaks to you. Surely we would believe it. Surely, but he doesn't. How can that be possible? Well, I was talking to an older sister, an Adelaide sister actually, some years ago, and I was, we were discussing this very, very question. How could you not believe the angel? And this sister said to me, she said, I can quite understand it. Oh, really? 
And she said, when you're barren, when you can't have children, you go through this emotional roller coaster. It's a big roller coaster, she said. What happens is you've tried to have children and you can't. And then someone comes along and says, well, if you do this, this and this, that should work. So you try this, this and this and your hopes are going right up here and it doesn't work and you come crashing down again. And somebody else comes along and says, oh, no, no, no. What you need to do is some other things and these other things are et cetera, et cetera. So you try that, your hopes go right up and then it doesn't work and you get it crashing down. And she said, after a while, you think, I can't live like this. I can't cope with going up to emotional highs, thinking that we're going to have children and then crashing down. So what she said to me is, you just develop this approach where you're refusing to let any hope come into your life because you can't bear the thought of going through another emotional collapse. So you just steal yourself. You can't accept it. And so she suggested that maybe that's what Zacharias and Elizabeth had done. They'd written off the idea of having children. They were not even going to countenance it. So when an angel comes along, he, his mind is, oh, I just can't accept this. Just can't accept it. Anyway, that's an explanation that fits me. So sometimes we might think, you know, if only an angel appeared to us just once in our life, that maybe, well, we'd never sin again. And that sounds plausible, doesn't it? Because here's an evidence, a clear evidence of God being represented in an angel coming to us. There can be no doubt in our mind then that God is real and the angel is real. So why should we sin thereafter? Well, there was a couple of priests, as you know, Nadab and Abihu, that actually went and ate with the angels. You come back to um, Exodus chapter 24. Now, this is when the children of Israel are at Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel. So they're going up on Mount Sinai. Verse 10. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. They saw the angels and there was under his feet, as it were, the paved work of a sapphire stone, as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Upon the nobles and upon the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. So they had a meal with the angels. How about that? Wouldn't we just love that? Have a meal with the angels to talk with the angels to get an insight into their thinking, to get instruction from them to us. That would be a fabulous opportunity, wouldn't it? You'd think you'd never sin ever again. But it didn't work for Nadab and Abihu, did it? In Leviticus 10, they sinned. They offered strange fire. And this they're carried out of the temple dead. And you can see a depiction of that. that Aaron is just absolutely stunned and shocked. So it didn't work for them. I think there's a big lesson in this, brethren and sisters. What builds faith? Is it appearance of angels? Is it those grand things like perhaps what happened on Mount Carmel when the fire came down and consumed the sacrifices? No, it's not, is it? It's only the word of God that actually builds faith. Romans 10 says that. Romans 10 tells us that Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, doesn't it? The only way it comes is what the Bible says is through the Bible. So it's a reminder, isn't it, that we need to give our attention to the word of God. The word of God is the paramount thing that will build faith in our lives. Of course, angels will help us in trials in our faith, but faith itself comes from the word. Now, we get to the bit where Zacharias, sorry, where Mary goes to visit um, Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1. Now, we're skipping over briefly um, what happens with the angel turning up to Mary. 
So we find that it says that Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. The angel Gabriel says to Mary in verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. So they're cousins. Now, I tried to work this out uh, because some of the commentators say it just means some form of relative. I don't get that. So this is how I think that it worked, that there was, in fact, common grandfather and common grandmother for Elizabeth and Mary. So just to try to resolve it and to work it out, I, I don't like it when I can't figure things out and get them all organised and put in pigeonholes, etc. Now... <clears throat> Okay, so we go to the part where Mary comes to visit Elizabeth. So Gabriel has appeared to Mary. Mary is in her late teens or early 20s. Mary believes Gabriel, as distinct from Zacharias, who doesn't. And she's told that her cousin Elizabeth, who's well stricken in years, so she's in her 60s or 70s, is expecting, which of course is an absolute miracle, isn't it? So Mary goes from Nazareth to the hill country of Judea, verse 39. And we looked at that before. That's where Zacharias and Elizabeth are living because they're living where God put them to be. Now, look at what Elizabeth says when Mary comes in. Whence is this to me? This is verse 43. Whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? The ESV. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What an amazingly humble sister is Elizabeth. Elizabeth's in her 60 to 70s, and Mary, who's perhaps some 40, 45 years younger, comes to see her, and they're living in a society where older people are respected by the younger, and that's the way it ought to be, isn't it? That's scriptural. And yet she says, this is a privilege that you have come to me. But look at her understanding. She says, the mother of my Lord. She's a good Bible student, isn't she? She knows that this child that's going to be born of Mary is going to be Messiah, and he's going to be her Lord. She won't even see him in this life. She's only going to go and see him in the kingdom. Wow. And that's all in her mind, isn't it? She'll be dead before Christ is crucified. And yet she foresees his death, his resurrection, his return, and her resurrection. Because she's got to be there. Now, there's... Just simple words like that, fill out the, and you can fill out the whole picture, can't you? What an amazing sister she is. She knows her Bible. She's not only knowing it, but she's putting all her faith in the promises. The promise of the resurrection, the promise to be with her Lord in the kingdom. I think that's just amazing. So, that's as far as I'm planning on going, because I assume that we're supposed to be stopping by about 12 o'clock. Um, so I've skipped a few slides. So for some lessons, Zacharias and Elizabeth had to endure harsh and oppressive rule of Herod and, a, and corrupt priesthood. We can thank our God that we have rulers that allow us freedom. Luke uses the exact terms for Zacharias's work in the temple. It tells us that we can trust in the Bible to be accurate in all things. Zacharias and Elizabeth made big personal sacrifices in living where God said they should. Similarly, the lesson for us is doing what Christ has commanded us may cost us too, but we will be rewarded in the kingdom. Zacharias and Elizabeth lived righteously before God, despite being surrounded by the hypocrisy of the other priests. And we should be careful to demonstrate godliness in our public lives and also in our private lives, shouldn't we? 
Zacharias and Elizabeth maintained their trust in God, despite God not answering their prayers for a child. When trouble comes in life, we should not feel that God doesn't care. He has our eternal good in, the, in mind. You know, that's so important isn't it, to have it in our mind's eye, that what God is doing for us is for our eternal good. It might not be for our immediate good, but it's for our eternal good. And that's what we really want, isn't it? Zacharias didn't believe Gabriel's promise that they would have a son. And so even if we could see an angel, it wouldn't necessarily result in us having an unshakable faith. Faith only comes from the word of God. Elizabeth showed absolute faith that the baby Jesus would become her Lord in the kingdom. And so like her, we can have confidence that Christ will return and that we can be in the kingdom if we genuinely strive to serve our Lord now. Thank you.